is it still possible for a person who's a black belt to, to then just go back to that beginning journey, I guess? For of course. Let me tell you something. I'm probably gonna catch a lot of flack for saying this. I have a belief. I won't say something, I won't, I won't call it knowledge because it's not known, but I, I have a fervent belief that human beings in most skill activities, not all skill activities, but I will say combat sports for sure, can reinvent themselves in five-year periods. Now, you might be saying five years. What's magical about five years? Mike Tyson was 13 years old when he was taken in by Customato. By the age of 18, he was beating world-class boxers in the gym and had already made a, a strong name for himself in international boxing. He was already a known figure. It was five years. Yasuhiro Yamashita, the judo player, mm -hmm. began judo at 13. He placed silver in the All Japans at 17. I could go on all day with examples of athletes who within a five-year time frame of starting a sport were competing at world championship level. I'm going to give you a rough and ready definition of sport mastery. Okay, I believe that if you can play a competitive match against someone ranked in the top 25 in your sport, and it's a serious international sport, I would call you someone who's mastered that sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you're, you're damn good. Um, if you can go with the number 25 wrestler in the world and give them a hard competitive match in the gym, you may not win it, but you know they had a good workout, you have shown mastery of wrestling or indeed any other combat sport you care to name. There are numerous examples of people doing far better than that in five years, winning medals at world championships and even Olympic games in that five-year period. This is not an unrealistic goal. There is a lot of empirical evidence to show that people have done this in the past, a lot of it. So if you, you fully immerse yourself in a sport with a well-worked out, well-planned training program, there is a mountain of evidence to show that in a five-year period, you can go from a complete beginner to a very, very impressive skill level to the point where you're competitive with some of the best people on the planet. You can reinvent yourself in these five-year periods. What happens with most people is they get to a certain level and they get complacent, they get lazy, and they just keep doing the same old thing they've been doing. But if you're diligent and you're purposeful, five years, you can accomplish an awful lot. And as I said, there's a mountain of evidence to show it. By the way, as a small aside, somebody who's mentioned Tversky and Yamashita in the same conversation, you're one of the most impressive people I've ever spoken to. Oh. But as, <laughs> as a small aside, uh, so if, if there's this complete beginner, this is really interesting. You're, there is empirical evidence that you can achieve incredible things in a short amount of time. How, there's a complete beginner standing before you and that beginner has fire in their eyes and they want to achieve mastery. Where do you place most of the credit for it? for a journey that does achieve mastery? Is it the set of ideas they have in their mind? Is it the, the set of drills or the way they practice? Is it genetics and luck? Hmm. What, uh, those are all good insights. All of those factors you've mentioned play a definite role. Uh, let's start with luck, okay? Um, we are all subject to fortune, and fortune can be good and fortune can be bad. Uh, life is in many ways beautiful, but life is also tragic. And I've had students who showed enormous promise and just tragic events occurred in their lives. Um, the vicissitudes of fortune can be a wonderful thing in your life and they can be a, a, a terrible tragedy. Um, I've had students who, who died uh, 
for various reasons who could have gone on to become world champions. Um, I've had students who, uh, on a much lighter note, just fell in love and just wanted to have kids and move away. And that's that's a that's a wonderful thing, but different direction. Um, you just never know. So luck does play some role. Um, even things like where you're born, uh, the location of uh, your physical uh, location in the world, or even socioeconomic location, can can play a role, which could be detrimental or, or favorable. So yeah, luck does play some role. Thankfully, it's one of the smaller elements. Um, and uh, I do believe that a truly resourceful mind can overcome the majority of what fortune throws at us and and get to goals, provided you're sufficiently mentally robust. Um, other things you mentioned, genetics. Uh, I do believe in certain sports, genetics really do play a powerful, powerful role. Uh, for example, in any sport where um, power output and reaction speed, um, uh, ability to take physical damage, then there are genetic elements which will help. Okay, For example, I couldn't imagine a world in which even if uh, I have a crippled leg, so even if I uh, grew up in a world where my leg was was normal and I had normal legs and everything was fine with my body. I don't believe that I could win the Olympic gold medal in 100 meter sprinting, for example. Okay, I just don't have enough fast twitch muscle fibers. But the more a sport involves skill and tactics, the less you will see genetics playing a role. If you look at the medal podiums in Jiu-Jitsu, for example, you will see that no one body type is definitively superior to another. You will see every variation of body type in, in the metal platforms in, in Jiu-Jitsu. Um, as skill and tactics become more and more important and things like just power output over time become less and less important, then you will see that um, uh, genetics play less and less of a role. I'm, I'm happy to say that the sport of Jiu-Jitsu the evidence seems pretty clear that there's no one dominant body type in the sport of jiu-jitsu. Rather, there's just advantages for one type and there's advantages for another. You just have to learn to tailor your game to your body. Um, with regard to training program, yes, I believe with all my heart and all my soul that your training program does make a difference. I've dedicated my life to that. Obviously, I'm biased in this regard. Um, I do believe that all of the students that I taught who became world champions would have been great athletes whether or not they had met me or not. I believe that. But I do also believe it would have taken them a lot longer and they may not have gotten to the level that they did. They, I'm sure they would have been impressive, but I do believe that the nature of a training program plays an enormous difference. I don't mean to say this in an arrogant way. I believe that it's there's, again, a mountain of evidence to suggest this is true because you see it in many different sports. Let's talk, for example, about your country, Russia, and its wrestling program. Russia is an enormous country, but the location where Russia's wrestling program comes from is actually very small, and the population is actually very small. I can't verify this, but I was told once, I, I can't verify this, but the number of people who wrestle in Russia is actually significantly smaller than the number of people who wrestle in the United States. It's also not part of the school uh, uh, athletics, and it is in the United States. Yes, uh, that's a different point. We'll come back to sure. right to that, because that's also an important point. But if you look at the actual numbers of people there, they're actually pretty small. So ostensibly, if, if it comes down to a numbers game, America should dominate at the Olympics because we have more wrestlers. Now, there's, the story gets more complicated because America has a different style of wrestling, the collegiate style, than the international freestyle. That is a complicating factor. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, what you see there is that numbers aren't everything. Rather, the manner in which people are trained clearly has an impact. And... We know very little about the, there's very little reliable information about the training program for wrestling in, uh, in the Russian states. But one thing is incontestable is the amount of success that they've had in international world championship and uh, Olympic competition. They are disproportionately successful. 
despite their relatively small numbers. There's nothing genetically special about them. Um, you can talk about performance enhancing drugs, but those are a worldwide phenomenon. There's, they don't have any access to technology that the rest of the world doesn't have. Um, uh, at some point, you've got to start asking, what are they doing differently in the training room? And there are many other examples of similar situations. My country, New Zealand, um, has an insanely successful rugby program, the sport of rugby, which they have dominated uh, for literally generations, despite the fact that our population is very, very small compared with the rest of the country. And we don't excel in many other sports. It's New Zealand does fairly well in uh, sports overall, but nothing like they do in, in rugby. Um, and you've got to ask yourself, is there a culture there which, which built this up? And the world is full of examples of seemingly small and unpromising areas or locations putting out disproportionately high numbers of successful athletes. And that points to the idea that different training programs have different success rates. And so I truly believe with all my heart and all my soul that how you train does make a significant difference. I would even go further and say it makes the most difference. Is it the only thing? Absolutely not. We've already talked about fortune. We've talked about genetics. Um, uh, if you want to get nasty, you can even talk about things like performance enhancing drugs. That obviously plays a role in modern sports. Um, uh, but I do believe that the majority of, uh, of what creates success is the interaction between the athlete and the training program. Now, the training program is one thing. I, I do believe that's the single most important, but right behind it is the athlete themselves. Okay. Um, in my own experience, uh, people talk about athletes that I've trained successfully, but they never talk about athletes that I've trained unsuccessfully. Um, always remember that for every champion a coach produces, there's a hundred people that they coach that no one ever heard of. And this is completely normal. A coach can never take the lion's share of the credit. A coach creates possibilities, but it's the athlete who actualizes the possibilities. And so building that rapport and finding the right people to excel in your training program is also a big part of it.